I challenge you, if you've never listened to one of your own calls, listen, listen to one, yeah. you know, record a segment of it. Or if you, let's say you don't have any recordings, why don't you record yourself and go through it normally at the speed you think, and then go back and listen to it. I promise it sounds three times faster than it does in your mind when you're doing it live. And you have to remember that we have to present, teach, educate, um, explain, ask questions at their level of understanding and not our level of knowledge. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Life Insurance Academy podcast. Zach and I are kicking it old school. We're like Run DMC. Mm -hmm. I think there's two of them, right? Bruh. Maybe. (laughs) We'll have to check it out. Dude looks like a lady. What are some other DMC, Run DMC hits? Do you know? No, it's not my head, no. All right. Well, we're just going to roll with the podcast. Today we are continuing our series, Things I Wish I Knew. That's what we're talking about. Previously, on the previous episode, if you checked it out, we talked about um, niches. We talked about niches. So maybe you decided which niche you're working in. Maybe it's final expense. Maybe it's mortgage protection. Maybe it's in the crazy IUL land. I don't know. Um, But we're going to talk about today processes, the processes that we should know or that we wished we knew at the very beginning of all this. Mm-hmm. And now, man, not just processes. This is a side segue here conversation, but tools and resources that are available now. Are you kidding me? Like, it's nuts. Like, when we started, we didn't even have Waze. We didn't have GPS, which makes us sound really old, and you're not even that old. No. That's how fast technology has progressed. So um, all sorts of great tools and resources. But today we're talking about processes and the the importance of uh understanding them the things we wish we knew about them yeah and the cool thing is about this series is the things we wish we knew um and it turns out that you guys are one of two people listening right now you're either the person that started and somebody told you that it's easy you just you know people want uh life insurance you just help them You, you 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 pick the plan you write the policy you get paid a bunch of money um, everything's good and grand and you do it again. I mean, all we do is just call all these people and <laughs> your expectation is, um, oh, everybody's just, they're just sitting there chomping at the bit to buy insurance and you yeah. just got to call these people or you got to go show up at their door and they're literally like shaking to sign this policy so darn quick. <laughs> you don't think about the process or what it takes yes. or what is required. So you're either that person who then jumps into it and then goes, Jew. Why, why is it not working for me? Mm-hmm. Why, why, am, why am I struggling? You all said it was going to be easy. You all said all you had to do was show up at the door. All First, you had to we do never was said that. No, we didn't. Right? <laughs> right, right. But talking about this is to their other IMO, right? Yeah. Um, or you're the, the person on the other side that's like, wait a minute. I need to figure out how do you do it? What do you say? How do you walk? Do you go sideways? You know, yeah. You're trying to figure out every detail and every little process before you get started which both of these are good and bad, um, depends on where you are. Too much of either is really good. If you don't have any process or any expectation move into, into this, um, you can kind of uh, get over your skis. But mm-hmm. the positive is you're eager, you're learning, you're willing to try something new, yeah. and, and you're ready to get out there. The other person who processes too much, I may be one of those, um, You come into this and it may be forever before you get started, right? You may be uh, training for nine months before you go out in your first week. Uh, That was not me, by the way. But um, you could over-process. We call it um, paralysis by analysis. And and the negative side of that is is you're trying to put too many processes in place before you're able to actually go serve families and make a difference. So the things we wish we knew is... What's the right amount of information? What are the processes that you need to consider um, now that you have really found your niche or found um, the the type of insurance or the segment of insurance that you really have a passion for serving those clients um, and walking into this? So 
uh, Chris, in your opinion, what was, what's the first process we need to work on? The very, uh, the very first thing that we have to do in this business is get in front of people. That's the very first thing. So there, there's a, there's a process to this, whether it's, um, leads. Mm -hmm. So you've decided you've entered a niche where, uh, it's, uh, primary, uh, focus is lead based. So I would say maybe a mortgage protection or final expense niche. The, the, these are niches that were created because they know where they can get data from. So they can pull that data. That data allows us to market. That marketing brings leads in, whether they're social posts or whether they're direct mail. And uh, you're able to work that. Um, maybe your other process for this is to start doing social posts. Yeah. I know folks who are very successful with that. They're doing IU Well Education and they're doing social posts. They're getting hundreds of leads or they're niching into specific businesses and doing educational posts and they're generating leads that way. Either way, there's, and, and I think you say this best, Zach, you talk about the relationship with time and money on mm -hmm. getting in front of people. You want to talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, Every, I, I always tell people there, there's two relationships with time and money. One is everybody, uh, the most attractive thing about this insurance industry is the pursuit of time and money. Um, but when you get into it, you have to choose one or the other. You have to trade it. You have to trade it mm -hmm. until you earn the right through renewals and a book of business and putting your clients first and becoming a difference maker to actually earn time and money. Um, but the same can be said when it comes to leads. Um, let's say you have a, um, financially you're in a comfortable, stable place to where you have money. So you are able to buy higher buyer intent leads and notice I didn't say higher quality or, right. you know, higher buyer intent leads that like, generally cost more money. If you were focused on, qual on quality, it would be thread count. Am I right? <laughs> yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, Not the person or what they were trying to buy. That's yeah, right. so higher buyer intent leads, um, which is typically going to result in higher conversions, but it's going to cost you higher money. So you're going to spend less time prospecting, less time calling through, less time right. knocking, hopefully more time doing presentations, writing actual applications, but you're giving up higher um, costs per lead in order yeah. to do so. So if you're, you're doing telesales, you may have uh, some process where calls are being transferred to you, so mm -hmm. you're doing less time dialing. Or you could be buying some sort of digital lead, um, but as a very high buyer intent, very high cost, so there's yeah. some sort of expectation and pre-qualification involved Correct. in that. The flip side of that coin is... Um, you know, you have time or money. So the other side is time. If you don't have the money, you have to be willing to put in the yeah. time, meaning you're going to be buying, buying um, lower buyer intent leads at a much lower cost. So there's going to be more legwork, more hustle, more phone calls, more door knocks. The old, uh, elbow grease. A little elbow grease um, to help generate and, and manufacture those opportunities Correct. to have presentations and convert mm -hmm. into policies. Uh, there's one or the other. Every, trust me, everybody wants to spend less than $200 a week on leads and then write ten, fifteen thousand 15000 right. in annualized premium on the other end of that. And that's just not reality. Uh, the results, it's, it's not necessarily going to be that starting out, um, especially when your experience and your other processes kind of aren't in place at this point. Right, right. So uh, you have to determine where you are in this whole thing. And if you are in a position where you don't have funds, then you do have to do the work. And we've had some great conversations recently of agents who are doing their social posts. We, mm -hmm. we have agents who, who are even doing some like seminars on the life side in different creative ways Yes, with very low cost and it's generating premium as a result of it. So, um, and I will say this about, about the leads. If, if you do have money, why not add the time to it? Yes. Right. Why, why not uh, put that work in um, to where you're really uh, have exponential growth and really expanding um, and blowing up your business by doing that? Because if it's working on a smaller scale, scale it up. That's really yeah. our goal. And let's say you don't have the funds immediately. Let's make a plan to figure out what we have to do to hit different benchmarks and reinvest a little bit more so we are going towards that area. And I'll tell you what. Um, 
I think one of the biggest challenges, this is one of the biggest challenges with people who join an IMO, okay, is they come in and they will join with a lot of enthusiasm with, Mm -hmm. in some examples, I'm not saying everybody does this, but they'll join with a lot of enthusiasm and, hey, Zach, great news. I quit my job so I can put more time into this. Um, I have zero money to invest in leads. I actually have, I have like 300 bucks to invest in leads, but I've got $3,000 of credit card debt, but um, I'm going to make this work, man. And you know, the, the visual we say is it's me handing you a rope and then jumping off the bridge. <laughs> like and, you know, Now you're, you're trying to save me and pull me back up without uh, having a realistic expectation of, I wish we had a whiteboard so we could show this. Um, but really, you know, we have this thing of getting in front of people. But then there's this other thing of having a sales process. So a process to get in front of people mm-hmm. and then a sales process. And these really do dovetail together mm-hmm. because that there's a learning curve for you to master to be able to get profitable. And the people who are doing that and saying, here, hold the rope while I jump off the bridge yep. are are not giving them a chance to win at all. It'd be great if somebody, if you go into this saying, hey, I'm committed to this, this is what my funds are, and then seek counsel for this, or at least tell your IMO, the people you're coming into business with, what you're willing to do. Like, hey, I don't have the funds, but you give me one of those leads and I will go knock on every door in this city to figure out how to generate enough income to afford leads. I'll tell you, that's, uh, I have this conversation a lot. I I get a lot of people reach out to me about leads and this is what I want to accomplish. This is what I have to spend. What do I need to do? And my question is always the same. What is your time commitment? What is your dedication, right? right? What are you willing to do? Because that can determine everything. Even if you have a lot of uh, funds or resources to put towards leads, right? if you only have two days to dedicate the time aspect of that, then it may determine what's the best route for you. Um, but you have to be able to make time, like you said, uh, that, that marriage between the workflow process and the sales process. In order for those to be, you know, migrate together, just, just, just kind of coexist um, for you to be successful, is that commitment to how many hours a day are you working? How many days a week are you working? How many weeks a month are you working? And this is a realistic conversation um, because a lot of people, um, they start this new opportunity and they hear the stories of the freedom and the flexibility. And then that all of a sudden takes a hold of them. Um, So understanding that in the best way for success and, and, and what a lot of us, a lot of new agents wish they knew at the beginning is what time and effort it actually required. Yeah to have the results that you desire, which is very, very different. There's always a disconnect on that. Um, That's true. Because I always tell people there's X number of phone calls, Chris, before you're comfortable in the first 20 seconds of the phone call. And you're going to be uncomfortable until that. I don't know what that number is for everybody. It's different for everybody uh, based upon their personality, based upon their sales experience. Um, But they have to put in that time. They have to put in that work. Um, and when it, what, what are they going to do when it gets tough or they get a bunch of no's in a row or a bunch of no answers? What are they going to do when it's really good and they're getting, they're closing a bunch of sales early in the day? Like the answer to those questions is going to determine their commitment, their dedication. Yeah. Are they going to be successful? Because there's levels to this. And in each level, you need to learn, you need to grow, you need to develop, you need to adapt. Um, to continue to get better, um, really what it is, as you're moving towards that sales process. So really, we, we have two things of getting in front of people. One is the, the, the leads or the opportunities you're taking to um, create mar- some type of marketing to get in front of people. Then two is the commitment to a workflow Yes. to, to make those things happen. And then that really kind of flows into this. Now what do we do? Yeah. Right. Now, now I'm in front of people and, you know. It's, I'm working my tail off. I have all the leads. Now what do I do? And right. That's um, it for the show, guys. We'll catch you on the next. Just kidding. There's the saying more. I always say is 
and, and they, you'll get these questions, but what about these leads? But what about that leads? And you always try to maximize one versus the other. Um, you're not, you're not equipped for that. You're not no, ready for that it doesn't, conversation. And it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter no. to be honest. I always tell people all leads work if you work all leads. So that takes the aspect we just talked about leads, right? And we talked about work. All leads work if you work all leads. Dude, that sounds wise because you reversed it. That's why it sounds wise. Yeah, also, yeah. <laughs> That's very good. And you don't, That's a tip you for don't, you You guys. don't say anything else after that. You no, just stare you just at pause them. and <laughs> stare. That's great. Um, but the next step, as you said, Chris, we, we know we're working. We know we're dedicated. We know we have leads. Now what do we, now what do, we do? Do we just wing it? Um, and this is crazy. I get, I've had, I had this conversation last week, actually a brand new agent. First time I've ever spoke to them. Um, they just reached out for just some advice. I talked to them and they were talking to me all about, you know, buying leads and, and being able to go work. And, and my question was, okay, well, you know, what, what's your experience like? How, how have you, have you, you know, knocked on a door? Have you made a phone call? What are you planning? How's your approach going to be? What's your sales process? Oh, I don't really know. I figure I call people. Okay, perfect. Do you do you have a script? Have you done that? Have you listened to other calls? Have you um, have you done any call sessions? Any any type of trainings or boot camps? Or have you watched videos? No, I haven't done any of that. I figure you know. It, it, and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> you know. Let, well, let's let's slow down a little bit on these leads because without a sales process, without a duplicatable sales system that you can go back to every single time, without a presentation, without a script, without something there, you don't have anything to compare it to. Mm-hmm. So when you don't have anything to compare it to, it's always somebody else's fault. The client didn't have enough money. These leads are terrible. Right. Um, it, the training isn't very good. It's always somebody else's fault. But when you have a presentation that you use religiously every single time, every time in the home, you start to see, oh, it works for all of these clients, right? You have something to compare it to. Was it just me delivering it? Was it not very good? Or was it just not a great fit for the client at this point? Um, Let's say you're on the phone. We know the script is proven. We know it works for other people. There's belief and confidence built inside of the script. Well, what was the issue then? Because we know we're consistent. A lot of these cases, a lot of these systems nowadays, Chris, which is crazy, is like a lot of their calls are recorded. Like, so you can go back and listen to yourself. Yeah. How many people do you think actually do that? Uh, I can make up a stat, probably 25%. I think that's high, but (laughs) I I really don't know either, right? I don't know. Yeah. But uh, you could probably, while you're listening to this podcast, you could think, well, have I done that? Yeah. Because one thing you'll you'll realize is when you go back and hear yourself like, wow, I actually s- talked faster than I, I, I think I should have. Yeah. Or I could tell she was confused. The client was confused when I went over this portion of the script. Maybe I should have slowed down or asked some more questions or uh, this is where I felt like I was starting to yeah. lose them. There's a there, quick tip. 90% of why people fail on the telesales process is because of pace. Mm-hmm. They're going way too fast, way too fast. Seniors are not processing the information and uh, they're, they're lost and confused. You confuse, you lose, but they won't tell you they're confused or lost. No, they won't. Just, well, I need to think about it. That's typically the And here's something I've learned from the podcast, which is crazy. Um, when I hear or I hear a recording of our podcast or I hear our podcast are playing, even on some of the, like our social media reels and stuff, sometimes it feels like, wow, I'm, I'm talking pretty fast. Yeah. Like, but in my mind, I know what I want to say. I have the thought coming out. I have the explanation and it's like excited to come out. <laughs> it's, it's excited. So in my mind it makes sense, but yeah. it doesn't always deliver the, the way I feel that it's delivered. Yes. And that's the same in the home. Yeah. That's um, a really good point. If you can yeah. slow yourself down, and, and, and I challenge you, if you've never listened to one of your own calls, um, listen, listen to one. Yeah. You know, record a segment of it. Or if you, let's say you don't have any recordings, why don't you record yourself and go through it normally at the speed you think, and then go back and listen to it. I promise it sounds three times faster than it does in your mind when you're doing it live. Yes. Um, and you have to remember that we have to present, teach, educate, um, explain, ask questions at their level of understanding and not our level of knowledge. 
Um, because we've, I mean, chances are, if you have any experience in life insurance and you're going through your sales process, you said these same things over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And when you do, you kind of get into a rhythm, you kind of get dialed in, you get consistent with it, which is a good thing in a way, but sometimes that takes away the organic feel of it. You can start to go through the motions. It can start scripted, but naturally it speeds up because you know which word's coming out next. And you want to get to the next call in some cases or the next presentation. I'm just trying to figure out if they're going to buy or not, Chris. Right, yeah, yeah. So in this, uh, these uh, processes, we wish we knew, uh, get in front of people, workflow, determining that. And, and I do want to go back to that, just what, what determines the workflow and this whole piece here is what you want in the end. And you have to decide that. Like you need to decide what you're fighting for and what you're trying to accomplish and what it means, all that stuff. Put a price on that because there will be a number of hours that will produce that Mm -hmm. typically. All the the time. It's not even typically. Um, Now, how that gets achieved, you may be able to leverage other people's hours to be able to achieve that later on. But in the meantime, it is. It's elbow grease getting in front of people having those conversations. So getting in front of people, sales process, having your presentation, your script. And guys, if your sales process, it's okay on the front side if it's, hey, I'm the insurance person. Do you have an insurance? Do you still have an interest in this? That's okay if it's on the front side of this. But there's a skill set that you need to learn. I, I remember when Roger was teaching us all about the presentation and our face-to-face sales. And it probably took me eight, seven, eight times until I finally caught on to asking the question, why is this important to you? Because I was just working off my personality and my ability to connect with people. And that's what I was selling off of. But I wasn't getting all the sales I could have, that's for sure. And I wasn't keeping all the business How do you realize the difference, though? When I heard it. Because you, you were still getting sales. Right. Correct. So how did you, did you just like, ah, I'll do it. <laughs> I mean, I, how, how did you get, how did you get to switching when you have that false sense of success? Yeah. Well, it was a, it wasn't uh, a close ratio that I was happy about and I was going to these trainings. So I would put myself in an environment where I would learn. And I realized after hearing it enough that, oh, there's a process. I guess I'll try it. Yeah, there's a sales system. It wasn't a guess I'll try it. It was a wake up. It was like, holy moly, I wasn't doing this. Why wasn't I doing it? I was kicking myself. Mm -hmm. That's that's where it changed. Uh, Because I it was frustrating to me that I sat in so many of those stinking trainings and I never heard that. I never heard it. I was probably on my phone. (laughs) I was probably goofing around or joking around with somebody or doing something. I don't know, but... Whenever that was said, it never connected with me. But I finally, they say, you know, it takes seven or eight times Mm -hmm. to finally hear something, you know, and that's what happened in my my case. And that's where I developed the the emotional excavation and that language and trying to get to those those questions of just resuscitating. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) There we go. He's gonna. I just tried to make graphics for Adam. But that's what we do. We plan it out just so we can see you do all kinds of funny stuff. <laughs> now, that that leads to this next piece. So we, we got in front of people. We, we have a committed workflow. We have a sales process. And then do we have a, a process for evaluating ourselves? Mm. And that's that will I determine. This one. Yes, that will determine, I guess, your... Um, Sometimes I think uh, there's a lot of volatility on the front of this. And and Adam actually had a a good input into this. And he said, you know, you have a good week, you think you're the best agent in the world. And then you have a bad week, you're the worst agent in the world. And you're bouncing off of that your first, maybe your first couple of months, your first three months. But how do you know whether you're, it's your, it's not just your bank account. How do you know when you're winning or losing in this business? Let me ask you a question, Chris, and I know, I know you're a big numbers guy, so this is just you know, be as accurate as you can. In life insurance, selling by yourself, okay, what is the highest amount of money you think someone can make in one year, just on their own pen? I think it's tough to get past 
probably the six hundred thousand dollar mark in these niche niche spaces. Um, I and think, you, and you, and, and it's it can happen, right? Oh yes, yeah, yeah. Now, and there's there's different niches that have bigger opportunities, but it's less sales. But correct. And, and most most niche, it's probably going to be six to seven hundred thousand on your own pen. And I would say that's probably well above the average producer, correct. right? Mm. Now, what is the lowest somebody can make and actually still be in insurance? Oh, geez, oh, I've seen people. Um. I mean, you're talking about their income or you're talking about on the, the issue paid side or either when the same, I mean, it's you probably, probably going to be like 70, 70,000, maybe a little less on that. And you can survive on sales or income on, Oh, I would say on the sales because there's lead cost, but so the income probably 30,000. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's. Yeah, and I'm guessing there's dual income or there's something that's that's allowing them to but, feel but safe. But that's, at that's that kind level. of like the bottom, correct? Right? Yeah, or so, zero. <laughs> I mean, zero. So the realistic, yeah. we're looking at thirty thousand to half a million dollars. Yeah, that range is crazy <laughs> different. It's insane. That yes. range is nowhere else in a job yeah. description in yeah. any other industry that you can make anywhere from thirty <laughs> to half a million. Right? Correct. The difference is an evaluation process. The difference is. Where do you want to fall in that graphic between 30 and half a million? Yeah. Where is that desire? And again, as you said it earlier, it's attached to your why. It's attached to how bad you want it. What vision, how clear is your vision you have for your family and your life and what you want to achieve and how bad you want it is going to directly translate to how hard you're going to work for it. And there's so many people that jump into insurance and they don't have a mentor. They don't have a coach. They're not asking questions. How do I get better? They don't compare it on, yes, I got the sell, but I feel that that was mostly on my personality. How could I have done better in that, in that home? How can I have done better with that client? How could I serve them better? Do I need to get more product knowledge on right. um, how I can best provide a solution for our clients' problems and vulnerabilities? How can I address objections before they become objections? How can I get better at reading different clients' emotion and body language and tonality? How can I get better at understanding different people's personalities and their past traumas and how it affects how they make decisions today? This evaluation process, if you really become obsessed with getting better, you're going to dial in your lead flow process right? This yes. translates to everything. You're going to figure out which leads work the best for right. me and my sell style. Am I a speed seller or mm. am I a thorough in-depth seller? Right. Right. Mm. Am I a person that can get to X number of leads a week, but rather that be a large number or a small number? Um, how much am I willing to invest in the leads to have the proper return on investment that's going to fund my vision that I want? That directly translates to and my discipline on my schedule. These are my set hours uh, through the days of the week. This is my set hours on the weekend. This is how many vacation time I'm going to give myself. Right. Like when you start breaking down the workflow process, your sales process, and you start really picking that up apart, that's when you take that presentation. How do I get better at page two? How do I get better at this middle section of this script? Because it's, it's, I'm not that confident in it. How do I get better at presenting the prices and closing? How do I get better at being so passive or the insecure salesperson? Right. Like, how do I hit those next levels? And you do that one at a time until you're polished and you continue to do it over and over again. Just imagine like, Kobe or Jordan shooting free throws right. over and over again, mm. in-game scenarios, this evaluation process is the difference to where you're going to land in that 30000 or half a million. And we're not even talking about building teams, building agencies, any of that. This is just you understanding what you need to do and what level you want to be at. Yeah. This reminds me, uh, we were talking earlier about, about golf and – I had taken my son and a buddy of his, and they, they don't golf. You know, Ty plays baseball. That's mm -hmm. his That's his gig. So swings up here, not down here. And uh, at the beginning of the game, I have this bucket of balls, and we're just chucking balls into the bag because I know where they're going, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and we're golfing, and uh, I'm watching the scores. The scores are coming along, you know, like, oh, that was a bogey. 
Oh, wow. That's a bogey. Okay. Well, bogey means something completely different to you than it does me, you know, and we're keeping that <laughs> score, you know, they come around and they're around. We don't count the donations. Chris. Right. Yeah. Like 40, fifties, you know, mid fifties. Uh, but we have to stop by the car to get more balls. Like we lost 20 balls between these two guys. So <laughs> they're loading up again, this whole new, new round for the balls. And, uh, I think that's how a lot of agents approach their work. Yeah. <laughs> and thus, you know, it's the score isn't real. It's based on how you feel. And I, I did okay. Uh, but the reality is, you know, the balls are in the woods here. And we didn't track it. We don't even know. We don't even know. So when we're talking about evaluation, it helps to have somebody who knows what they're talking about to help you evaluate. Now, I'm golfing with them so they didn't have somebody who knew what they were talking about, right? I, I don't have much to offer in that conversation. But you have to find a mentor who can help you know what numbers mean, and you have to tell the truth. That accountability piece. Yes, you have to tell the truth about the numbers, about all the things you mentioned, work hours. Those numbers tell a story. Like, what what is the story? Mm -hmm. um, whether it's how many hours you're working, tell the truth about the hours you're working. Whether it's how many presentations that didn't close, tell the truth about the numbers that didn't close. Because that person who's sitting beside you, that mentor who's walking alongside you, will be able to tell you what's happening based on what those numbers say. That is an evaluation process. 100%. And the, the biggest question is, well, I want to have consistent results, right? <clears throat> I want to have consistent deposits in my bank account. That's the that is the most important part in the in result, or is it to make you look good? Yeah, it, it's yeah. not it's not about having the big flash week where you sold a bunch and then yeah. there's one excuse after another to why you didn't have a good month. Mm -hmm. The end game is we want consistent deposits, consistent results, which only comes from a consistent workflow process. Right. It only comes from understanding I'm ordering leads every single week. I'm working them every single week. I have the consistent work schedule that's going to back that up. I have a consistent sales process. I use the same presentation. I use the same script every single time. It's duplicatable. Yeah. And then all that results together into the consistent results, into the consistent um, deposits yeah. is yeah. what we all want. If we all want that, but we if we want to take a step back and evaluate our process, we want to evaluate. And if we just go ahead and write down all the excuses of why you didn't do it and then see if you actually believe yourself, you probably won't believe yourself, yeah. even though you expect other people to believe you, <laughs> yes. um, which is the truth. That's really good. But when you look at that, you will, you will see the holes in the areas in your professional insurance career that you can patch and fix and grow from there just by looking at that, yeah. you, you know, um, and the coach and mentor can help put that out, point that out to you, but you have to be willing to listen. You have to be willing to learn, uh, but you have to figure out what level you want. Yeah. And I, one of the favorite things, I love sports, right? Um, I'm also not very good at golf, but I love it. It's fun. It's the most frustrating, yeah, enjoyable I, sport in the world. I've seen you do pretty well, so being <laughs> honest. Not, not, not all the time. <laughs> Um, but you look at these professionals on TV, right? Whether it's golf, whether it's basketball, whether it's the national championship game, and you wonder, like, these people are, are going pro. They're becoming pro. Look at their results. Look at where they're at. And we all want that. We want that level of success in our business in insurance. But look at the layer below, Look at the effort. Look at the practice. Look at the dedication. Look mm -hmm. at the film study. Look at the conditioning. Right. Like they're eating right. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're sleeping right. There's a cost. There's a major cost. And you don't see all of that. Right. We tune in to see the result. Correct. But behind the scenes is everything else. Mm -hmm. Like how many days of practice, how many hours and seconds of practice do they put in for you to see that yeah. hour and a half game on TV? Yeah. or to watch them perform on a Sunday to, to get the green jacket or, you know, mm -hmm. whatever it is. We want the result without putting in the work because a lot of us are blind to what the work actually is. Right. And when we can realize that, and if they're pros in their sports and we want to become pros in ours, it's simple. This is what we have to do. Yeah, very good. 
So uh, a reminder for us, uh, the things we wish we knew, just uh, understanding processes of A, uh, getting in front of people and the workflow that takes to get in front of those folks. B, having a sales process that we're committed to. C, uh, evaluating our processes and understanding that uh, the numbers will tell a story, having somebody that you can go to and have those conversations with. Uh, we hope that this was valuable for you guys. Consider those things. Tell yourself the truth about your, your numbers and your, your activity. Uh, I think it will reveal some things for you. But uh, thanks for jumping in on this. Do we have another ser- Is there another part to this series? Or are we starting something new on the next one? Cool. Do something we're, new. We're cooking something up for you guys. Cool. But we will see you. Oh, first, before I do that. Tell them. Tell them. I'm going to tell you guys. Tell them. I don't know if you're ready for this. They may not be. We have we have a like button down here. Like it. Hit the button. If you if you saw value in the podcast, hit that like button. Subscribe. We did the study, and uh, Adam looked at our data, and I think it was like 67 percent of the people who watch this. We get lots of watch hours aren't subscribed. You guys want to know what's going on? Hit that subscribe button and leave a comment. We love to interact with you guys. We love our family. You guys are our family. And we will catch you on the next Live Insurance Academy podcast. See you soon.